Um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what is soil health at the beginning and how we might uh, help improve it or maintain it in our pasture settings. Um, one of the things I would say right off the bat is if I were to go back through each of the presentations you've seen already and pulled out what their best uh, management tip was from each of those different presentations, uh, it would uh, make mine <laughs> because uh, that's the way we maintain uh, healthy systems is to be uh, managing our fertilizer and our water and our weeds and our um, uh, uh, other inputs and, uh, and uh, pressures on the system effectively. But I wanted to kind of put it more in the context of, of a holistic uh, view of what soil health is here uh, for you. Um, sometimes it's easier for us to uh, visualize anyway, uh, from a visual point of view, what um, soil health is not. Um, typical signs of ill health in a soil system would be uh, runoff where we're not, uh, at least uh, by design, over irrigating uh, our, our field. Um, typically, or uh, compacted areas or bare ground often, uh, which would allow for the invasion of weedy species, as we've heard uh, previously um, in some of the presentations. And then uh, just uh, an observation of reduced production or stand life uh, over what we might expect um, from a particular pasture planting would all be uh, things that we can more easily uh, uh, observe and see uh, that would indicate that, that the system is not really as healthy as it ought to be. Um, my colleagues are going to give me a bad time because um, my favorite topic is soil salinity, and I neglected to, to include that here. If we see signs of, of salt uh, deposits or crusts forming at the surface of the soil and things like that, it would also be an indicator of reduced soil health in those conditions. Uh, good soil health is often a lot more difficult to uh, quote unquote see because it requires some measurement. It requires us to get in and take a look at the soil itself to analyze for things like uh, good uh, aggregation and stability of those aggregates or uh, either maintained or increased organic matter content. Uh, microbial diversity, we had some folks asking about uh, biological testing and things like that. Those would be indicators that the system is uh, actually uh, in good health or improving in health that we can actually measure. And it requires us to go out and take samples and take a look at what's actually happening uh, in, in the matrix itself. But other things uh, that we would note in, in a healthy system is that we have better nutrient cycling and availability and uh, longer uh, stand life and productivity as we go along. So what I thought I would do is rather than focus on the measurements themselves and, and how we go about sampling for them and so forth and monitoring them, I thought about what are the, the real practical aspects of um, doing what we can to maintain or improve uh, soil health in pasture settings. So uh, I'm going to cover each of these uh, in, in series as we go along here. We're going to talk about protecting and feeding the soil biota. We're talking about managing uh, grazing intensity, and we're going to talk about uh, interplanting uh, complementary species in our, uh, in our pastures to provide uh, uh, continuous cover and improvements in, uh, in nutrient cycling. We're going to talk about uh, then also a proper combined fertilizer and water management, uh, much of what uh, we've heard previously just uh, put in the context of soil health. So let's start off with protecting and feeding our soil biota. Soil microbes um, are primarily responsible in our soils for creating uh, really the binders that hold our soil uh, aggregates together, the polysaccharides, organic acids, and other things that are intermediate breakdown products of the organic matter that they're decomposing in the system. This forms kind of the glue that then holds our soil, our mineral soil particles together and improves uh, aggregate uh, formation, aggregate stability, opening those soils up to allow for good uh, water and uh, aeration, water penetration and aeration. And they're also responsible, the soil microbes are, for cycling of our nutrients and the transformation of those nutrients into plant available forms. So breaking down the organic matter, weathering the minerals that are in the soil, fixing nitrogen from the atmosphere and providing it to the plants. Thanks for muting those folks, appreciate that. Um, so those are the things that those microbes are responsible for. And in order to thrive and function the way they ought to, they need a steady supply of carbon. 
they get that from the cycling of just the plant materials at the surface of the soil or below ground with uh, roots as they grow and wane. They get them from manure and urine uh, from the grazing animals or external sources that we might bring in and apply. Uh, they get it from root exudates. That's uh, stuff that's uh, photosynthesis, uh, th uh, sugars and things that are produced by the plant that are pushed through the plant out into the rhizosphere. We're going to talk about that a little bit in the grazing section, but these are also uh, supplies of, uh, of, of readily digestible carbon that help uh, the microbial uh, population thrive. <clears throat> um, it, it's kind of surprising to a lot of people to realize how uh, uh, populous the soil is with living, uh, uh, breathing um, uh, bacteria and fungi and other, uh, other little creatures that, uh, that, that do all this work for us. Um, it truly is a living, breathing tissue. Uh, billions upon billions of, uh, of uh, individual uh, bacteria and, and fungi, thousands and thousands of different species in, in our soils that, that do all this processing. Um, there are things that we can do or do do commonly that suppress uh, the, uh, the health of those uh, microbes. Uh, we get into droughty or poor irrigation management conditions where we're uh, under irrigating or not supplying enough water. Overuse of fertilizer or pesticides, uh, which can contribute to salt buildup, uh, excess um, uh, salts that uh, reduce the ability of the, those microbes to thrive. Pesticides that may have non-target effects on their uh, on their survival as well in soils. And then soil compaction and reduced aeration that just restrict the overall function uh, of that system. So we need to protect those, we need to provide for them. Uh, we need to make sure that we're getting uh, good adequate aeration and moisture into the system and uh, that we get a steady supply of carbon that comes into those systems uh, over time. Uh, maintaining a good healthy root zone, uh, bringing in additional sources when needed. Uh, and uh, as we'll see in the grazing section, uh, um, Encouraging root exudates in the rhizosphere will will uh, move us towards a proper condition. The second area that I wanted to kind of talk about was managing our grazing intensity. Uh, grazing is actually really good for soil health um, when done properly. The act of grazing itself uh, sends a stimulation signal to the roots of our uh, forage plants uh, and encourages their uh, the growth of the roots. It's a response to try to repair the damage to the above ground uh, um, uh, shoot uh, of the plant. And then this actually increases root exudates into the rhizosphere. It helps kind of kick the microbial uh, population into increased activity. Um, we're going to get more nutrient availability. We're going to get better cycling. It's going to feed that top regrowth uh, much more quickly than it would otherwise. So uh, grazing to uh, a, a, a proper extent um, is going to actually stimulate root growth and improve the rapidity of regrowth uh, uh, on our plants in, in those graze situations. The grazing animals also deposit manures, uh, which are sources of these ready, uh, readily digestible carbons, that feed the system and keep uh, the microbial population uh, thriving. Excess grazing, on the other hand, <coughs> is counter to maintaining good soil health in pastures because we get uh, uh, compaction, uh, too much wear and tear on the, on the plants themselves. Uh, grazing too low to the ground actually can uh, stop uh, root growth entirely in, in our plants in, in pastures. Uh, beyond 50% uh, uh, removal of the top can uh, severely uh, hamper uh, root <coughs> growth uh, in general. Um, and it also causes shifts in the stand mix. If we have a mix of legumes and, and grasses, for instance, uh, some of those plants may not be able to take uh, excessive wear and will uh, wane from the mix. Uh, excessive waste uh, that's deposited in a uh, high intensively uh, grazed area can also uh, contribute to additional salt and ammonia burn of new regrowth. So we would encourage in any of these settings to employ rotational grazing strategies. I won't go into the details of those strategies. You can look at the USU Extension Small Pasture Management Guide for some really good ideas there, um, which will help you uh, decrease the pressure on any given area in, in the pasture to allow for 
the good uh, aspects of uh, grazing that can help uh, maintain a healthy system. The next area I wanted to talk about really quickly is interplanting with complementary species. Uh, as has been mentioned in the past uh, presentations, cool season grasses have a bimodal growth habit, meaning they have uh, growth early and late in the season, the cooler parts of the year with uh, a reduction in growth during the summer. Some of our legumes that we might mix into pastures, um, alfalfa, clovers, vetches, and other things that have been mentioned uh, peak a little bit later, <clears throat> and they maintain production uh, throughout the hotter parts of the summer when the grasses are waning. Warm season grasses actually peak in the summer, uh, conversely uh, compared to cool season grasses. So planting multiple complementary species in a pasture allows for us to uh, fill in the gaps when some plants are not growing as well with those that are growing better. And that increases uh, not only the production in the pasture, but also keeps the root system active um, where it might be uh, depressed in cool season grasses during the summer. Others can fill in and keep that microbial activity up as well in those systems. The ground remains well covered. Uh, production meets demand there. We don't have to graze it as intensely and we can rotate more freely uh, through uh, uh, ro rotational grazing. And uh, legumes in the mix then also can reduce nitrogen input requirements uh, in general uh, on the whole for uh, the entire pasture as uh, Dr. Yost mentioned in uh, the fertilizer recommendations. So uh, let me just give you kind of an example of some of what am I talking about here. So in this first graph, and I think maybe that blows it up on your screen, um, we can see that uh, the dotted line are perennial uh, uh, cool season grasses. Um, this typical, this is ryegrass, but it's typical of a cool season grass. We have a peak in the spring and a peak in the in the early fall, but it wanes a little bit in the summer, whereas the clover that's inter, uh, interplanted with it is peaking on those uh, periods of time when uh, the grasses may be waning just a bit in their production. And so we can develop strategies with mixes of various plants. Sorry, I'll go back. Uh, here's cool season grass mixed with alfalfa, the same uh, type of uh, uh, condition here where we're filling in the gaps and keeping productivity high, keeping active root uh, zones um, busy uh, during uh, some of the times when uh, some of the species may not be as performing as well. Uh, we're going to focus just on the middle graph of this particular figure where you have cool season species of grasses mixed with warm season species of grasses, not just uh, clovers or alfalfa or other things like that. So uh, planting complementary species in a pasture can help uh, keep the ground covered, keep the root zone active, uh, keep the microbes happy, and uh, meet the demand for production, allowing us to more freely rotationally uh, graze. Um, the other, uh, the last aspect I wanted to talk about was uh, maintaining good fertility and water management. Uh, these are inseparable. Um, it's been mentioned over and over again that adequate moisture uh, provides so much uh, benefit, um, uh, proper uh, uh, fertilization, as Dr. Yos mentioned, is going to give us the, the proper benefit, but we can't separate the two. So um, we have to have the moisture there to provide for the use of those nutrients that we apply. The plant transpiration stream is really the vehicle for nutrient uptake. And if we're in excesses of soil moisture, we're going to reduce aeration. We're going to increase the chance of nitrogen loss from volatility. We're going to shut down root activity, especially in legumes, uh, in anaerobic conditions, waterlogged conditions. Uh, we're going to get runoff that can cause erosion and nutrient losses and uh, wet soils typically are more easily compacted uh, aggregates are easily disrupted and uh, if we uh, raise the water table levels that may be locally uh, 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 present we can increase uh, salinity uh, buildup in the soil as well so fertilizing and irrigating to need is really the the key to it and remembering that in pastures that are healthily grazed uh, we can actually recycle uh, most of our phosphorus and potassium through the waste uh, of the animals and uh, a lot of the nitrogen, uh, though much of that might be either volatilized or utilized uh, within the body of the animal. But um, a great deal of that can be uh, recycled in those systems. So with that, I'll quit. And uh, any questions you might have, uh, you can 